Hello, my name is Michael Burton. I'm a professor of political science and director of the McCourtney Institute for Democracy. Thank you everyone for joining us today. It's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Daniel Ziblatt, who teaches in the Harvard Government Department and studies comparative politics, democratization, and European politics. Daniel's been to Penn State before, but he's here today because of what he and his co-author, Stephen Levitsky, have to teach us in their best-selling book, How Democracies Die, which applies comparative and historical lenses to American politics. One thing I've learned is teaching and just following American politics these days, and I suspect I'm not alone, I know Daniel mentioned this earlier today, is how much comes at us so quickly. On any given day, so much is happening that at other times would seem important and dominate the news, but which today are quickly forgotten, overwhelmed by the latest tweet, outrage, or change in policy direction. How democracies die shows us how democracies can move incrementally on a path towards something more authoritarian. It helps us to identify among everything that is happening what is important for our democracy. Emphasizing a decline in democratic norms, Ziblatt and Levitsky show us how we can draw upon the experiences of other countries to better understand the challenges facing our own. They show us that America is not immune to democratic backsliding in its own history. They teach us why this happens and they offer useful indicators of authoritarian behavior to apply now. These explain, for example, why calls to lock up one's political opponent should concern us. After Daniel's talk, we'll have time for questions, and after that, copies of the book will be available for purchase at a 30% discount because the book is currently on the Penn State bestseller list. I strongly recommend this book, which for political science is anyway, is beautifully written, accessible, and absorbing. The McCourney Institute has had several speakers this year on the theme of democratic dissent. We've heard critical perspectives from across the spectrum, the political spectrum, about the current state of American democracy. Among Ziblatt and Levitsky's contributions to this are their insights into what it is that has so many people dissenting and protesting a political moment that feels to many like an inflection point towards a less democratic future. Before we begin, let me encourage everyone to follow the McCourtney Institute for Democracy on social media, Twitter and Facebook, and to watch out for our new podcast, Democracy Works, which will launch this week. You can find it on our webpage or wherever you get your podcasts. It's up on Apple today. Our special thanks to Daniel today for racing from the airport to WPSU to take an episode that will appear in the next couple of weeks. Finally, we hope to see you at our next event, the Center for Democratic Deliberations Annual Burke Lecture on April 10th at 4 p.m. at 100 Life Sciences Building, where Robert Assen from the University of Wisconsin will speak on Lives Live Together, How John Dewey and Milton Friedman Imagined Human Relationships, and Why This Matters for Contemporary Public Engagement. But first, Daniel, welcome to Penn State. Except for my two daughters who are looking, who are very happy about tomorrow's snow day. Um, so yeah, it's wonderful to be here. Um, I'm going to talk today about the discoveries that Steve and I uh, made in writing this book, or the lessons that we learned while working on this book. But before I do that, I wanted to begin first by just talking a bit about why we wrote the book, and kind of tell you the, the, the sort of history. In some ways, it wasn't obvious we would write this book. Um, we are scholars of comparative politics. I, I've spent my career studying European politics. Steve, my co-author, has spent his career studying Latin American politics. We have taught together, we've worked together, taught graduate courses, undergraduate courses together on democracies in crisis, democratic breakdown, and other parts of the world. So we don't primarily, with our professional hats on, study American politics. But we decided we wanted to write this book, in some ways probably motivated uh, by 
through experience that probably many of you share. The 2015-2016 election, we watched the unfolding campaign in the primary season and the, the presidential election with at first puzzlement, disbelief, shock at what was happening, at the tenor of the politics. This is really what motivated us. The campaign resonated us for us, though, in a, maybe in a slightly different way because we have spent our career studying other countries. At first, it was really just the small echoes. Candidate Trump was someone who nearly fit to the T a kind of set of characteristics that Juan Lin's a great political scientist who lived, who grew up in Weimar Germany, lived through the Spanish Civil War, had identified a set of characteristics he had identified as being hallmarks of authoritarian leaders, in the book written in the 1970s. So the rhetorical bluster is now familiar to all of us. 2016 candidate Trump railed against the media in unprecedented ways for a presidential candidate. He refused to say he would necessarily abide by the results of the election. He threatened to lock up his political rival if elected. Uh, and he worked crowds into a frenzy and in some instances seemed to be condoning violence at election rallies. So many people thought this was all talk, um, and in many senses it was. But Linz in his great book on democratic breakdown uh, on Latin America in the 1960s and 70s in Europe in the 1930s had noted that these four rhetorical moves of attacking the media, <coughs> questioning the legitimacy of elections, questioning the legitimacy of the rival, and condoning violence, these four rhetorical moves were the clear hallmarks of what he identified as a, as a potential authoritarian leader, somebody who ahead of time you should keep your eye on. So with these historical examples in mind, alarm bells went off for us. Furthermore, no major presidential party candidate in American history had spoken this way. And because many candidates in the countries we study had spoken this way, this left us with this uncanny feeling that we had seen this movie before, and we knew that it usually happens in other countries, and it usually doesn't end well. So we decided we really had to write this book. So we wanted to draw upon lessons from other countries to think about ways in which countries, when confronted with a political leader like this and confronted with democratic crises, have overcome their crises, and in other countries where they have not, where they've succumbed to these crises, to try to draw, draw, try to draw lessons from the United States. Now our goal is really to conduct a kind of so, a sober analysis, one that wasn't hysterical, one that was really taking the conditions and the threats of American democracy seriously but trying to expand the discussion, to kind of put this in a broader, comparative, global framework. And so when writing the book, we came to some conclusions that I think depart in many ways from how people think about the Trump presidency today. The, the basic conclusion at some level is, the problem facing our democracy today is not just Donald Trump alone, it's not his outrageous comments, it's not his psychology, it's tempting to focus on the latest outrageous tweet, on political gossip, on the political spectacle. But at some level, this is a distraction. We have to keep our eye on the ball. On the ball. At the end of the day, we, we come to the conclusion that Donald Trump was in fact a symptom, not as much a cause of America's current political ills. He was a symptom of a deeper set of ills in the American political system, and we wanted to kind of dig into the <coughs> work. So today, that, that, that was our motivation. Today what I'm gonna do is talk to you about the discoveries of the lessons we learned. And there's really three, I think we can kind of boil it down to three main lessons, uh, three discoveries. So let me start with the first discovery. Discovery number one is this. The best way to stop authoritarians from coming to power, it, from, from, the best way to stop authoritarians is to prevent them from coming to power in the first place. This may seem obvious, so what exactly do I mean? The best way to, to prevent authority, to block authorities, to prevent them from coming to power in the first place. In the context of the United States, this means we have to pay attention to not just how, uh, why Donald Trump was elected, but how he ever became the nominee of a major political party in the first place. So let me elaborate. In the Cold War, three quarters of democratic breakdowns came at the hands of men with guns in the form of military units. Since the collapse of communism, most democratic breakdowns now come at the ballot box through elections. Demagogues come to power in elections, and once in power, they usually inflict serious damage on a country's political institutions. So a great paradox, really, if you think about it, for a democracy today is how does a democracy prevent an autocratic-minded uh, demagogue from getting elected in the first place, who then turns around and dismantles those democratic institutions that he used or she used to get into power. Now, throughout most of American history, this paradox has been happily avoided, 
But it was not because there was no demagogues that there wasn't support for demagogues. In fact, I think we have a tendency to really whitewash our own history and to forget there's really a nearly continuous strand uh, in American history of would-be authoritarians who find a remarkable level of electoral support. So this strand runs in the, just in the 20th century from Henry Ford in the 1920s, who considered running for president as a Democrat, the founder of Ford Motor Company, who was a Byron anti-Semite and quoted by uh, Adolf Hitler and Mein Kampf, uh, Huey Long in the 1930s, Joe McCarthy in the 1950s, George Wallace in the 1960s. So Gallup poll data going back to the 1930s show that each of these figures gained around 30%, 35% of Google ratings in Gallup polls. So this is a number that runs quite consistently. So I actually don't think it's too much to say that there's a continuous and latent strand of authoritarianism running as a subcurrent in American political culture, as in probably most countries. But here's the point. None of these figures that I just mentioned ever made it close to the presidency. They were popular, but they were kept far from power. So the question is, how were they kept far from power, and what changed in 2016? So we emphasize two, two contributing factors, and I'll just briefly talk about those. First, the way we picked up presidents has changed. Until 1972 in the United States, so really the first three quarters of the 20th century, presidential candidates were selected by party leaders who worked up close with, per with the candidates personally. They had a big say in choosing the candidates. So conventions were really opportunities for political leaders, party leaders, to get together and decide on the candidate. Uh, the system was described by some political scientists at this time as a system of peer review, where people who worked up close with presidential candidates and had seen them in moments of crisis and in moments of triumph knew how they reacted. They had a big say. So at this early stage, party primaries really had no role. They had, no, they, they had very limited, they were irrelevant. So of course voters mattered at the general election stage, but in the primary state, they didn't matter. Uh, primaries were not. So the system was rightly criticized as a system of smoke-filled back rooms by its critics, and it certainly had downsides. It was exclusive, it wasn't very democratic, and it sometimes very mediocre candidates um, were selected. Warren G. Harding is the prototype of this, right? I think of Warren G. Harding, the president in the 1920s, he looked like a president. That's partly why he was selected, but he was a terrible pick, president. So but all systems have advantages and disadvantages. And the advantages of this system was that it worked well, in fact, perfectly well, to keep the extremists from ever becoming viable candidates at the top of the table. Yes. Uh, he, he approves. Um, it, was, it was a screening system, a filtration system a gatekeeping system that kept demagogues out, a system of smoke-filled back rooms. It had its downsides, but it had its advantages. Now, we all know American history changed profoundly in 1968. It was a tragic year in American history, but it also changed the way in which we select our presidential candidates. The presidential system was opened up. The smoke-filled rooms were opened up. The general election was now preceded by what we are all familiar with, this kind of continuous primary season that goes on for two months. Now, this is certainly an open, more open system, but two political scientists at the time of this reform in the early 1970s reformed, uh, warned that you know, this might open the door to the Democrats. And to be clear, you know, I, I'm not advocating we go back to the old system. Okay, the old system. All systems, though, we have to recognize are double-edged. It was, it, the new system was more open, but if a Democrat ever ran for office, the road would be much clearer to the nomination. Now, Democrats in the 1980s picked and developed a system of superdelegates it served as an additional check. Republicans never adopted a system of superdelegates. So this left the door completely open. This meant that if a, demo, if a demagogue ever decided to run for president and found residence, especially in the Republican Party, without superdelegates, there was a much more open road for him to an nomination. And this is exactly what happened in the 2016 election. The modern day demagogue became the nominee of the Republican Party. But there's a second factor we elaborate on. So the question is how do you keep demagogues out of power? Second, factor that changed, and that, that, that I think it plays a crucial, in some ways more important role, actually, in allowing uh, Donald Trump into the presidency. Because after all, of course, Donald Trump could have, beat, uh, could have been beat by Hillary Clinton, but just as importantly, there was an absolutely imperative role to be played by his Republican Party allies. And here's really the central pivot of this story. Authoritarians come to power, not just through elections, but with the enabling aid of political aides, political aid of, of the establishment. Throughout history, this repeats itself. Italy in the 1920s, Germany in the 1930s, Venezuela, 
in Latin America in the 1990s. This is a crucial test when demagogue who clearly violates democratic norms and rules gets close to power. One of the last offerings is whether or not establishment politicians, party allies, finally break with the demagogue or the autocrat in the monkey, do they draw a line in the sand and say, beyond this, we will not go? Or do they abdicate? Do they overlook the democratic violations? Do they let party trump their commitment to democracy? In effect, do they form a Faustian bargain, allowing their ideological ally, their potential autocrat, into power? Do they enable the authoritarian? This is crucial because when elected autocrats get into power at this last stage, it's nearly always because mainstream politicians left them in the door. The enabling role of the Republican Party is actually not unique. This happens remarkably often. In Venezuela in the 1990s, uh, President Rafael Cadero, who was a long-time fixture of Venezuelan politics, freed Hugo Chavez from jail, gave Chavez a boost in legitimacy. Caldera's career was on the wane. He thought he could tap into Chavez's popular appeal. Uh, within several years, Chavez was president. Caldera was long gone. In Italy in the 1920s, Benito Mussolini was a complete outcast of the mainstream, but a long-standing prominent liberal politician in Italy, Giovanni Giletti, uh, thought he could tap into Mussolini's grassroots appeal on the radical right and included Mussolini on his Liberal Party list in parliamentary elections, boosting Mussolini's stature in the political system. Within a year, Mussolini was prime minister, Giletti was long gone. And in Weimar, Germany, in the late 1920s, the German Conservative Party, headed by a man named Alfred Hugenberg, saw Hitler on the horizon and tried to tap into his appeal as well, issued joint proclamations with with Hitler's party, which was a, was a pariah party at this point, Tr uh, held joint rallies, trying to draw on Hitler's popular grassroots appeal. But this backfired. The conservatives disintegrated. It legitimated Hitler. And in January 1933, when conservative statesmen sat around trying to decide should they elevate Hitler to power or not, the main advocate of this, uh, Franz von Papen, famously said to one of his conservative friends as he was making the case, you know, we, let's, let's nominate Hitler to the position of chancellor. He said, don't worry, this is von Papen. Within two months, we'll have pushed him so far into a corner of the school. In every instance, mainstream or established establishment politicians open the door, advocate, fail in their gatekeeping responsibilities, and out of miscalculation or opportunism, let the extremists in the door. In every instance, the mainstream politician makes the same mistake. It's a kind of Faustian bargain. They think they can control the Democrat. In every instance, the Faustian bargain backfires. Establishment politicians lose control. So the same thing happened in the United States in 2016, I would argue. Many leading Republicans, even after they, it was clear they publicly just, they despised him, they didn't want him to be the nominee. They nonetheless, no, none of them endorsed Hillary Clinton. You know, perhaps they could have. This might have put democracy ahead of party. Um, and if you think that's unrealistic, uh, you know, you don't have to look very far for a similar kind of situation where politicians made a different calculation. In 2017, uh, French presidential election, François Fillon, that country's Republican conservative nominee for president, he didn't make it to the second round. And rather than endorsing Le Pen or staying silent, he endorsed Macron, who had been minister and former socialist government, and many of his voters, they went to Macron, and this made a difference. So in the United States, we let our Le Pen in the door. Donald Trump was elected president. And once an authoritarian is in the door, it's a changed game. So what happened next? We're watching right? Uh, many thought, and many continue to think, for good reason, that once a demagogue is in the door, in the American political system, our constitutional protectors. There's a lot to this. After all, we have the oldest and most successful constitution in the world. It's contained many powerful and ambitious presidents in the past. Think of Richard Nixon, think of Franklin Roosevelt's failed poor packing scheme that was defeated in the 1930s. But here really is our second big discovery. Now, the constitution by itself may not be enough to save us. Constitutions don't just work on their own. They don't work automatically. If they did, you think of a case like Argentina, which my co-author has spent a lot of time studying, which adopted essentially the identical uh, constitution to the United States. If Argentina, if, if the only thing that matters is constitutions, Argentina would be a stable democracy. But Argentina's first democracy with this replica of the American constitution only lasted 14 years. They experienced six military coups over the course of the 20th century. So what's written in the Constitution is really not enough. Instead, in our book, what we argue is that constitutions work best when they are reinforced by two democratic norms or unwritten rules. And that these norms and unwritten rules that do a large part in constraining the potential democracy. So one norm is what we call mutual toleration, or accepting the legitimacy of your partisan opponents. 
This means that no matter how much we disagree with or dislike our rivals, they have an equal right to go. We recognize them as loyal citizens. We don't treat our rivals as enemies. So that's the first norm. The second norm is the norm of institutional forbearance. So forbearance means the underutilization of power, the self-conscious underutilization of power. When one does, doesn't exercise one legal, one's legal rights. So we don't really think about this a lot in politics, this notion of forbearance, but it's absolutely vital. You think about what a president can actually do under the American Constitution. The president can pardon whoever he or she likes at any point for any reason. A president with a congressional majority can pack the Supreme Court. You don't like how the, judge, the, court, the Supreme Court is making decisions? Expand it to 11, expand it to 13. This is entirely legal under the Constitution. The president's agenda is stalled in Congress. He can circumvent the Congress and rule with executive orders. The Constitution doesn't prohibit this. But think about what Congress can do. The Senate can use its right of advising consent to block every presidential Supreme Court nominee or cabinet pick that it wants. Con Congress, as we've just seen this last January, two months ago, can shut down the government over the budget and essentially lead, lead the government to a halt. And of course, the Congress can impeach the president basically on any grounds that it wants. So the point here is that politicians can exploit the letter of the Constitution in ways that undermine its Constitution, its, its spirit, which can throw a, a democracy into crisis. So this practice is what uh, a legal scholar Mark Tushnet calls constitutional harbor. So the idea, again, that you can use the letter of the law to violate its spirit. If you look at any failing democracy in the world, today or in the past, you will find lots of constitutional harbor. Argentina under Peru, Spain in the 1930s, contemporary Venezuela, Turkey, Hungary. What prevents our political system from descending into deadlock, dysfunction, and this kind of authoritarianism is forbearance. It's a shared understanding among politicians that neither sides will deploy their institutional prerogatives to the hilt, that the spirit of the law will prevail over the level of the law. <coughs> so in our book, we make the case that the norm, these two norms of mutual toleration and forbearance are the soft, soft guardrails of democracy. They help prevent what is normal political competition from, de to, from degenerating into a kind of death spiral of political conflict that wrecked democracies throughout history. So America, of course, hasn't actually always had these soft guardrails. In the 1790s, in the early republic, partisan intolerance and constitutional hardball nearly destroyed the early American republic. On the lead up to the Civil War, certainly constitutional hardball was reigning. But beginning in the late 19th century, Democrats and Republicans largely avoided constitutional hardball. They accepted each other as legitimate and avoided destabilizing acts of constitutional hardball. There were no impeachments. There was no successful court packing. Senators were judicious in the use of filibusters and the right to uh, the, the use of advice and consent. Outside of wartime, presidents largely refrained from acting unilaterally to circumvent Congress and the courts. So for more than a century, our checks and balances worked pretty well. But again, this was not because of what was written in the Constitution, but also because this was reinforced by these norms of mutual toleration and forbearance. So as we show in the book, our democratic norms have been unraveling in the United States over the last quarter century. We saw early signs of this in the 1990s, in the, early, in the Gingrich era, government shutdowns, and the partisan impeachment of Bill Clinton. But the process really accelerated in the 2000s. When Barack Obama ran for president, Republicans called him pro-terrorist, anti-American. Republican leaders like Rudy Giuliani, Newt Gingrich, Mike Huckabee, Sarah Palin said President Obama did not love America, but that Obama and the Democrats weren't real Americans. The birther movement even went a step further, questioning President Obama's very legitimacy as president. Now, America's always had an extremist fringe, and that was sort of my point from the beginning, it's 30%. But this wasn't fringe politics. These were national Republican leaders. This was the party's 2016 nominee for president. This means that over the last decade, particularly, leading Republicans have begun to deny the legitimacy of the Democratic rights. They've begun to cast Democrats as the enemy. Now, the, this kind of decline of mutual toleration, as we've seen in other parts of the world, this decline of mutual toleration encourages politicians to abandon forbearance. When we view our partisan rivals as enemies, when we view them as an existential threat to our way of life, we become tempted to use any means necessary to stop them. And that's, beginning, that's what's beginning to happen. 
politicians are beginning to throw forbearance to the wind. The filibuster, which was really a measure of last resort in the past, has become routine practice. Politicians shut down the government and refuse to raise the debt to them. We see extraordinary acts of constitutional hardball, like the legislative coup that followed the 2016 election in North Carolina. And actually, I think a lot of the politics over gerrymandering in Pennsylvania that we witnessed in the last year is kind of a similar kind of dynamic. But I think most dramatically, the Senate's refusal to allow President Obama to fill a Supreme Court seat. This is a move that was unprecedented since the 1860s. So let me pull the different threads of the story together. The problem is not just that Americans elected a demagogue in 2016. The problem is not just that demagogue got in the door, as I put it in the beginning. The real problem is that we elected a demagogue at a time when the soft guardrails protecting our democracy have become unmoored. So why is this all happening? This, the answer to this question is really lesson number three, the third discovery we made. We argue that what's driving this norm erosion is partisan polarization. Certainly rising economic inequality, changing media structures, all of these things matter and exacerbate the problem. But we emphasize that driving, fueling all of this is the fact that Republicans and Democrats have grown so far apart that they literally fear and loathe each other. In 1960, 1960, four or five percent of Republicans said in surveys that they would be displeased if their child married a Democrat. Today, that number is 50 percent for both parties. Last year, a Pew survey found that 49 percent of Republicans and 55 percent of Democrats said that the other party makes them afraid. We've not seen this level of partisan polarization and hatred since the 19th century. And it's not just traditional left-right polarization. People do not fear and loathe each other over taxes and health care. They just don't. Partisan differences run much deeper. They're about race, religion, and way of life. So our parties have changed dramatically over the last 50 years. If you go back to the 1960s and 70s, when many of us were growing up, uh, the two parties were demographically and culturally very similar. Both parties were overwhelmingly white, equally religious approximately. The parties differed on taxes and government spending and foreign policy, but on race and religion, they were similar and overlapping. Three changes have occurred over the last half century. First, the achievements of the civil rights movement in the 1960s led to a massive migration of Southern whites from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party. And the enfranchisement of African Americans in the South also led to the uh, migration of African Americans to the Democratic Party. Second, the U.S. experienced a massive wave of immigration, mostly from Latin America and from Asia, and most of these immigrants ended up in the Democratic Party. And then the third big transformation under Reagan, evangelical Christians, conservative Christians, had been evenly split between Democrats and Republicans, flocked to the Republican Party. So by the 2000s then, the Democrats and Republicans were now demographically very different. The Democrats were mostly a rainbow coalition of urban educated whites and a range of ethnic minorities. Republicans, by contrast, remain overwhelmingly white and Christian. And this is important because white Christians are not just any group. They were once the majority electorally, and they used to sit unchallenged atop political, economic, social, and cultural hierarchies in the United States. They filled the presidency, the Congress, the Supreme Court, governor's mansions, and they were pillars of local communities. They were the CEOs, the newscasters, the sports stars, the professors. And crucially, these, these were the faces of the both the Democratic and Republican Party. Those days are long over. But losing a majority status and losing one's social status can be deeply, deeply threatening. Many Republican voters, of course not all, but many feel like the country they grew up in is being taken away from them. This is what we think ultimately, and we make the case in the book, that we think is driving the polarization. Now polarization is dangerous because extreme polarization can kill democracies. This is a major lesson from the failure of democracy in Europe in the 1930s and Latin America in the 1960s and 70s. When politics is so deeply polarized that each side views the victory of the other as intolerable, as beyond the pale, democracy is really in trouble. When an opposition views, uh, when, when a government views, or when each side views the other, as intolerable, you start to justify using extraordinary measures to defeat the other side. 
things like violence, election fraud, and coups. Of course, in the United States, this is, we've not reached that point, but we have reached a point where according to exit polls in the 2016 presidential election, one in four Trump voters believed he was unfit for office, yet they still preferred him over the Democratic candidate. So we've reached a point where according to recent polls, Republicans have a more favorable view of Vladimir Putin than Hillary Clinton. This is a dangerous level of polarization. So Trump is a challenge, but the most fundamental challenge is this extreme polarization. Driven by a radicalized Republican Party that represents a declining white Christian majority whose members perceive themselves as facing an existential threat. Trump is certainly a symptom of that problem, but he did not cause it. And his departure from office won't end. So what can be done? I'm tempted to sit down right now. <laughs> um, there's a lot to say here, and I look forward to people's questions and discussion. But for now, I think I'll emphasize two, two points, and we have a chapter on this in the last chapter of the book. I'm going to emphasize two points. First, it's clear the Republican Party has to change. It has to become a more diverse party. As long as it remains an overwhelmingly white Christian party in a society as diverse as ours, it will be prone or vulnerable to polarizing white nationalist extremism. What can Democrats do? There's been a lot of talk in progressive circles uh, about learning to fight like Republicans. If Republicans are going to play constitutional hardball, this argument runs, then Democrats need to play the same game. They have to play tit for tat. If you don't, then the Democrats will be endless victims of sucker punches, stolen Supreme Court seats, and so on. And Democrats, in fact, are beginning to learn this lesson. They used, in effect, a filibuster in January to trigger their first government shutdown, straight out of the playbook of UP. Many Democrats will run, or, and are running this fall, on a platform of impeachment. And if Democrats win control of the Senate this fall, there's also lots of talk of denying President Trump the ability to nominate a Supreme Court justice, just as the Republicans did to President Obama. Now, this is an understandable response, but it's a response that worries both my co-author. If Democrats respond with constitutional hardware, it will almost certainly reinforce and even accelerate the process of norm relief. In other words, it will further corrode the Democratic Party. In our experience studying other democracies in crisis around the world, this sort of escalation rarely ends well. So the opposition to Trump should be vigorous, should be muscular, but it should be norm-defending, not norm-breaking. And should be based on a broad as broad a coalition as possible, one that extends beyond the traditional blue state constituencies that I'm from Cambridge, Massachusetts, where one finds this in, in large doses, to which Democrats have become accustomed. So, to some, I mean, we, we cannot take American democracy for granted. Many of us, I think, including myself, have long assumed that no matter how reckless politicians are, our institutions will endure. But there are lots of reasons, I think, that we are un to think that we are in uncharted territory. Levels of income inequality are higher than any time since the Great Depression. Uh, wages are stagnant for too many, have been stagnant for too long for too many. And we've begun a transition that, to my knowledge, no democracy has ever successfully undergone. One in which a dominant, previously dominant ethnic group loses its majority status. <coughs> I think it's likely we'll be the first to do this, and I hope we are the first to do this. But getting there requires that we overcome a highly high and intense level of polarizing reaction. So in the midst of that, we cannot afford to be reckless with our institutions. We just have too much to lose. I think. So we have time for questions. Please just come up to the microphone. We'll take people at work. My question would be, uh, we have two parties currently. One thing I realized during this election is that Democrats had a bad candidate, and my opinion, Republicans had a bad candidate. It was the Independence Times they get, get a good candidate and then just steal the election. And uh, then their candidate couldn't place a level on maps, so I don't think that helped. Who was the Independence? Who was the um, Gary Johnson. 
So I, I mean, yeah. no one just die on the Green Party didn't do well either. So is it time for more parties to get in? Uh, because as you said, we had uh, two major parties before, which were really based on race, where uh, white majorities in both really helped, uh, you know, not make elections so polarized. And so with now having um, you know much more diversified population, having a lot more parties, or breaking up the Republican Party and the Democratic Party into different parties to form coalitions with politics. Great. Yeah, thank you. Good question. Yeah, no, there's, um, so I've, I've given the, I've given versions of this talk with my co-author, and he and I disagree exactly on this question, so since he's not here, I can just give you the answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's very nice. Um, well, I'll, I'll give you both sides of this one. Um, you know, certainly we have a, a system in which it favors two parties. I mean, the, the way that our election system is set up, when you have single member districts, we're likely to have two parties, two dominant parties. And so the third, you know, the way our system is set up, every every one of you who wanted to vote for a third party candidate, you think is a wasted vote. And so that that accumulates to generate a two party system. Who those two parties are, though, is not necessarily pretty set. I mean, American history is there's instances of you know the Whig party disappeared, Lincoln's Republican party was founded, and at, at a similar moment, I would add, of extreme polarization over race. In that case, it was about slavery. So, you know, I think it's it, it's possible. So this is where my co-author might disagree. I, I say it's possible you can, I mean, there's kind of these weird bedfellows now. You know, there's neocon Republicans who seem to be almost Democrats. Um, and so there's kind of this, the, the, the kind of political, people's political lines are increasingly mixed up. And so we're in this unsettled moment. And so I think in an unsettled moment like that, it's possible for somebody to reconfigure this in, in the creation of a new party. I think that's possible. My co-author tends to disagree. Um, I mean, I think there'll continue to be two parties. Who those two parties are and what their identities are it remains an open question. You know, I, I, and so, you know, I think people should, you know, if they want to vote for third parties, they can to send signals to, but, you know, given our history, the two-party system is, the, is, you know, unless there's major and constitutional and institutional forms, these, are, these will be the actors. But I, you know, it's up to, at some level, up to political leaders, creative political leaders, to kind of reimagine the kinds of coalitions that are possible. I don't quite know what those will look like. Um, if I did, I would be out there campaigning. But you know, it's, I think there's room for creative political leadership to think about how to bring people together who historically have thought of, not thought of themselves as allies. So look, I think the idea is look for partners in different places. That Um, I actually read your book and I found it was terrific. And one of the things that struck me when you were talking about binding primaries after 1968 was, so did that make um, the election process a lot more expensive? Does that sort of open the door to much more money flowing in much, much broader ways? And does that mean then we should think about campaign finance reform or should we think about um, thresholds uh, for turnout in primaries so that it's not 70 percent of electorate in the state determining the outcome? Yeah, so, you know, so my account of primaries, I mean, I'm often criticized as being somewhat anti-democratic because I'm critical of primaries. And, you know, and many of you probably are in the back of your minds thinking that I secretly love the black, smoke the black group, which is not true, but I, but I think that it, there certainly were these advantages. Um, so a couple of things about primaries. I think it turns out, I mean, if I, if I could design, if I was starting from scratch and could design any political system that I wanted to, I would say we should have a two-round presidential system with no primaries, where you have lots of candidates running, high turnout. I mean, one of the things about a primary is there's low turnout. So the French system in which you have, people are allowed to vote expressively in the first round and then strategically in the second round, and you know, they, they, the stakes get higher, and you suddenly realize it's Le Pen against you know, another candidate, then, who are sympathetic to Le and then you sort of backtrack. I think this is a very good system, and it's more democratic because more people are voting, actually. The problem with the primary system is that you know, the turnout is quite low. Activists have, on both sides have much greater sway than, than uh, normal voters. Um, and so, you know, what, what, but given that we're not going to go to a two-round presidential system, what do we do about the primary? I think a lot of the reforms have to be kind of around the edges, like the kinds of reforms that we learned about, kind of small reforms. Super you know, keeping super delegates, not abandoning super delegates. I mean, one thing that is certainly true is, um, I was saying this earlier today, that if you look at the number of 
and I think we can do this in the book, we can track, at some point while researching the book, we track the number of people who are serious contenders running for the nomination since 1972. And the number of candidates in both parties is just increasing. You know, so it reached such an extreme level that in the 2016 election, if you remember, the Republican Party had two different debates. They had the adult table debate with all the top candidates and the little kids table debate with all the kind of less popular candidates. You get this proliferation of candidates, which creates these kinds of problems, which in many ways, I think, allowed candidate Trump to get through. He was sort of the last one standing. So behind that dynamic, I think, is the availability of money. Each of these candidates can stay in the campaign much longer because they have access to money. So it's both, there's a kind of demand and supply side. There's more billionaires, and so if you find your billionaire, you can stay in the primary season for as long as you want. But second, the way in which campaign, the, the, these elections are funded, you know, there's just such that the party doesn't play a role. People just have their own sources of money. There's really no limits on this. And so this just opens the door. I mean, this is a terrible analogy, perhaps. I grew up on a farm in Northern California, and we used to, um, when I was in elementary school, we used to go around with my friends, and we would find bugs, and we put them in a jar. You know, beetles, these nasty-looking bugs, eels, uh, all sorts of spiders and worms, and so on. We'd shake it up and see who would last the longest. <laughs> Poke holes in it, you know, let them breathe. And they would all fight with each other. The worm would climb up to the top, and just sit at the top, and the beetles, these really nasty, gluttony you know, would kill these little bugs, would all kill each other. The worm would come down at the end and see all these dead bugs, you know. And so in some ways, you know, having this proliferation of candidates doesn't necessarily mean the last one standing is the best candidate. Um, and so I think in some ways the primary the primary system is broken, the way that we suck our hands is broken. And lots of people have kind of known this, but we, it's never become apparent, I think, until 2016, when both sides were dissatisfied in varying degrees with their candidates. And so, you know, another, another kind of reform that might be important is the way the sequencing of primaries, um, you know, how, how, you know, when it's, you know, where it's spread out over such a long time period. Maybe, maybe there should be a single day where there's a national primary, and this would be another. I mean, there's lots of proposal ideas out there. And I think these things could make a difference. But at the end of the day, these are kind of institutional fixes. And part of the story that we're making, or the argument we're making, is a lot of underlying all of these institutional reforms is this high level of polarization. It's not clear that these institutional reforms will address that actually underlying high level. But they, they, can't, they can't hurt, I would say. Okay, you want to come to the mic? I, I think my voice is yeah, better. Yes. Um, I'm accustomed to public speaking. Yes. I have a question about every four years we have this profoundly important uh, decision to make as a people, and we have one day to vote. That strikes me as a little bit of nuts, nuts right? Mm -hmm. Now, then you can get asked to keep balance, do all these, you know, stuff. It will be online and all that crap. Nothing but open the door for widespread proliferation of corruption. I don't get it. Why one day? You just mentioned one day for all primaries. I think one day for anything that's important is nuts. Um, but then I might be nuts, but that's irrelevant. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I see your point, but I guess that's why, I mean, my, I mean, if we're in the realm of, we're sort of in the realm of um, political science fiction here about what's possible, perhaps, but maybe it's useful to have these kinds of discussions and the kinds of reforms that are possible. And I think a two-round presidential election actually gets one exactly this. People can express how their, their anger, send a message. If you want to send a message of anger on one day, you know, several weeks later, you come back in the second round and have a more. So that, that's another, that's a way, of, a way of addressing that concern that you have. But as it is now, I mean, we have the sequencing of primaries, and there's this momentum build, and it's, it's arbitrary where momentum builds. I mean, why, you know, and, you know, every state tries to, be the top of the line, you know, so California now will be it earlier than it was and so because it wants to exert its influence, you know, and whatever, what, what doesn't really matter which state is first, but at some level it's arbitrary, and, you know, that in the 2016 election, I mean, the, the journalists seem to report that the key turning point came in, in New Hampshire when Marco Rubio um, had this moment where he kept repeating himself in the debate, I don't know if you remember this, and he was knocked out, he did poorly in New Hampshire, and that was the end of it. And it just happened to be that you know, New Hampshire came at that moment, that was his moment to do well, and after that moment passed, it was over with. And so I think that the sequencing of primary seems to be arbitrary, and there's no real reason, and it has, it has an impact on the results. And so that's why I'm making the case for simultaneous, no, no state has no advantage. So you were, you were talking about, uh, and I mentioned too, about the dangers of criminalizing your opponents. Yeah. And, and 
So I wonder if you have any thoughts about what's going on with the, uh, the Russia investigation. And uh, so Democrats, many Democrats are salivating at the idea of Adam Schiff being let loose behind Donald Trump. Uh, but that investigation has become very partisan, especially within the House. Do you, do you see, do you have concerns yeah. about where that's going? Yeah, so the Juan Lin's checklist um, of treating of, a, of an authoritarian, like, treating your rivals as criminals. You know, one of the things he says is the thing, a warning sign is when politicians accuse their political rivals of being agents of foreign powers. Okay. Um, you know, when reading this, they sort of, at the time I remember, that, you know, that makes sense. But now, you know, in light of current events, you think, well, you know, the word adverb baselessly should perhaps be added. <laughs> I mean, you know, because certainly, you know, what do you do if your political rival is an agent of a foreign power, or your political rival is a criminal? And certainly people think that, you know, some, you know, Trump supporters may have thought Hillary was a criminal. Democrats may think Donald Trump is an agent of a foreign power. So if one doesn't know, and so that's why it's better just to avoid the rhetoric altogether. And so I think you're right that it's dangerous. I mean, I agree with you. I mean, I you know, I think there needs to obviously be a robust investigation. Um, I think it's a mistake to make impeachment to be the kind of calling card of Democrats in the campaign. Uh, you know, there may come a moment where impeachment is necessary. It'll be an unfortunate moment in, in some respects uh, because this is not how, you know, this means that crimes will have been committed and so on. And so, you know, if it becomes necessary, certainly impeachment, you know, obviously has to proceed. But I don't think Democrats should use this as a political tool. Re trying to restrain themselves is what I would argue, and not use this as a political tool because it creates a poisonous atmosphere. And, ne and the next time around, I mean, what do we think is going to happen? You know, so there really has to, I mean, the, 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 the virtue of the impeachment proceedings, you, know, you have to have a two thirds majority. And, and so you need to have in the Senate for, uh, you know, for the second stage of the impeachment process. So you, it needs, by definition, to be bipartisan. So I think by, impeachment needs to be bipartisan. If it's regarded as partisan, so if you get 51% of the House voting for impeachment, and there is in fact a norm around this. Um, uh, Mark Tushman, who I cited earlier, says that there's a norm of bipartisan impeachment. So in other words, at any point throughout American history, the House of Representatives, impeachment simply means the House of Representatives, a majority of the House of Representatives votes to impeach the president. Senate is the second stage of this that actually removes the president from office. But it's, it's quite striking if you stop and think about it that this hasn't been used every time. In each, in each instance where you have an opposition party in control of the House and a different party in control of the president, the House could have voted for impeachment. You know, they could have mentioned some of these, but they haven't done it, not because they constitutionally are not able to do it, but because there's a norm that this ought not be done in a, bi in a partisan way. So I think similarly Democrats today need to behave in ways that, you know, that reinforce the Democratic norms. Now again, this is not to say that there shouldn't be congressional oversight, and, you know, but this has to be done carefully. So the other thing that's worth talking about how these types of leaders are occurring in other countries, and in the European countries. But then the three explanations that you came up with things like primaries, those other countries don't really have those primaries. You talked about polarization, but it's not clear that polarization is necessarily increasing in these European countries, and it's hard to think about what polarization means when you have parties spread across the political spectrum. And then you talked about norm, trying to defend norms. Well, there's sort of issues about cordon sanitaire that various mainstream parties in Europe have applied to far-right parties, and then it's a and that, that literature sort of suggests, well, sometimes they work, sometimes it doesn't. It depends on when they're applied, are they applied soon enough? Because if you apply them too late, then the part you, by applying the cordon sanitaire, then you're making the issues that are raised by that party salient. The other alternative is just to ignore those issues and then pretend that they're not salient. And so I'm, I'm wondering, given that these things are occurring elsewhere and the causes that you're pointing to in the book don't exist there. Why Why are we believing those causes in this case as yeah. opposed to elsewhere? Well, I, I would say that on the, so for each of the, the question, I mean, each of those points, I mean, what the, many countries are sort of in playing with primaries. In fact, the French presidential election was the first president, in 2007, it was the first presidential election in which both parties used primaries, which is interesting because neither the Socialist Party nor the Republican Party made it into the second round, so it turned out not to be such a great system. But I think the broader point is, 
and this, these we draw on the historical examples, of role, what role do party leaders play in the selection of the candidate? So whether that is von Papen sitting around saying that you know, Hitler should be our guy, or Caldera endorsing uh, uh, Chavez, or our primary system. The point is what role do political, we, we think that political elites play an important role in selecting leaders. It's not just about voters, because in, in, in particular in the presidential system, party leads and, you know, and voters to somebody select the candidate in the first place. So the, the point is, what role do party leaders play? So to take another example, um, the, in Austria in 2016, there was a presidential election in which a far-right candidate, Green Party candidate, and a Green Party candidate were the last two guys in the second round, similar to France, and the Christian socialists who are conservative center-right party uh, endorsed the Green Party candidate. Um, of course, what's happened since is they've now gone into government in Parliament with the far right. So that you know, but and so when people, you know, that's true. But imagine the situation now if the president of Austria were a, a member of the far right and the government, the Parliament was controlled by the far right. And, and so you know that that actually worked out to be okay. So I think the point, the broader point is what role did party? The broader concept is gatekeeping and what role do political elites play in the selection of candidates? It's not just about voters. That's the first point. Um, on the second point about polarization, I mean, that, you know, so the, the countries that we are really interested in, uh, Hungary, Turkey, these are countries of extreme polarization, where party leaders, in fact, exacerbate polarization intentionally. So I have a recent paper that I wrote um, looking at how citizens view electoral reform in Hungary that was intended, this, there was an electoral reform carried out by Viktor Orban's government intended to bolster his majority. And it was viewed entirely through partisan lenses. Supporters of the, of the opposition were critical of it. They knew it benefited Orban's party, and support and Orban's supporters viewed it as uh, in positive terms of it since it benefited Orban's party. And so this polarization makes it easier for leaders once in power to implement the kinds of incremental uh, reforms that entrench them in power. Um, so. Uh, you know, I th so I think it is relevant. I mean, a, a, a kind of third point I would make is that, um, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about the far-right parties in Western Europe. And in many ways, I think I would actually distinguish, and I wouldn't vote for the far-right parties personally in Western Europe, the anti-immigrant parties, including Le Pen's party. Um, but it's not as clear-cut, I think, that these politicians are so explicitly, overtly anti-democratic. They may have policy, take policy positions that offend liberal, views, um, but they are different than, I would argue, the Viktor Orban's uh, Fidesz party, or the current governing party in Poland, um, Erdogan's party in Turkey. And I, I, I mean, I think that these parties, is, you know, the parties that push for Brexit and so on, you know, they, they were kind of single issue party. And so it's, in many ways, the West European anti-immigrant parties, as much as there's certain similarities in their anti-immigrant positions, their protectionism, whatever, in terms of kind of strictly Commitment to democratic norms, it's, a, it's, a, it's harder to tell whether these are strictly the analogous parties to compare. I would argue that actually Trump's clear violations of democratic norms in these countries. Um, I was wondering, like, the, I feel like neither party would object to the fact that, like, their ideology is meant to make their country better. Mm -hmm. So when did the, like, the use of partisan as a tool, as, like, a critique of power, party governs, like, how does, when did that begin, and why did um, parties kind of think of it as, like, uh, a critique of their integrity? Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, so in our book, we kind of give the history, a brief history of this in the chapter. I mean, you know, it's gone through periods of ups and downs. I mean, as I mentioned, in the 1790s, um, George, the, the Federalists, the kind of proto-Federalists and proto-Republicans viewed each other as treasonous enemies. You know, as far back as the 1790s, the Federalists were viewed as being agents of the British, and Republicans were regarded as agents of the French. And so it's very similar to the kind of rhetoric we hear today. In the lead up to the Civil War, similar kind of rhetoric, you know, where there was shootings. There's a new book coming out this year by a historian at Yale, Joanne Freeman, which demonstrates that she records the amount of violence that took place on the floor of the Congress as each side viewed each other as mortal enemies. After the end of the Civil War, there was a period of stabilization. I mean, where there, there, there was a the Civil War continued to be the same kind of issue. 
It's called waving the bloody shirt, you know, where you kind of brought up the Civil War to accuse the other side of being treasonous. But at some point in the 1890s, um, James Blaine, who was the leading politician, said it's time to fold up the bloody shirt. And so it's really in the 20th century. I mean, there's, there's lots of instances of partisan animosity, but at, the, at high levels of politics within the House, within the Senate, and within the presidency, the 20th century has been relatively, um, this kind of rhetoric has been absent. Really, beginning in the 1990s, late 1980s, we, we, you know, people could disagree with this. We say that Newt Gingrich, in many ways, was the originator of this. He took advantage of a growing sense of polarization um, and took advantage of this and began to use rhetoric accusing Democrats of being treasonous and being anti-country, anti-flag. And this is where, you know, and people, people may disagree whether Newt Gingrich began it, whether the Republicans began it, and we had a review of our book and conservative publications saying, well, Democrats began this. So, you know, people disagree about this, but in any case, at some level, the historical debate is important and interesting, but the question is, how do we get ourselves out of this situation? So somebody, between the popular vote and the electoral college vote, yeah. and how that might play out in the future? Yeah, no, that's, you know, and I, I, you know, I, I think it's hard to, I mean, the electoral college reform, there's, there's efforts underway to kind of organize the reform of the electoral college that are indirectly through the states, and you know, I maybe would applaud this, but at some level, again, this is one of these institutional fixes that won't necessarily address the underlying problems of polarization. That said, I think there is a genuine risk. I mean, we've tended to think of um, disgruntled Republicans as thinking that the system is rigged against them. Um, and this has fomented a lot of the kind of rhetoric that I've been describing today. But I think there's really a, a genuine risk, depending on how the elections go this fall, as well as the next presidential election, that we, if we have a House of Representatives and a Senate in which Democratic, more Democrats are voting but Republicans hold on to majorities. And, and again, in the Electoral College, we'll have all three branches of government. If we're in a situation where all three branches of government are not reflective of actual electoral majorities, there's the real potential of a legitimacy crisis, I think, from the left. I mean, I think people continue to play the Democratic game, Democratic <coughs> activists, you know, continue to play, win, try to win the vote, but if, you know, again, again, this fall, as well as in 2020, this goes the other way, I think there will be renewed pressure to kind of reform the Electoral College. I mean, again, you know, Americans tend to be pretty conservative when it comes to the Constitution, so, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine this really happening, but there certainly is growing pressure for this. Um, I'm wondering if you could comment on the role or influence of the news media. Mm -hmm. And there are several examples I think I could cite, but there's one example that's been gnawing at me for a few years. It's worth remembering that in 2008, uh, Obama's place of birth was questioned, I think, by a Democrat. And the state of Hawaii said, here's his birth certificate, case closed. But, you know, Wingnut said, oh, the, the Hawaii keeps two sets of records or something. We need to see the other one. And Trump sort of allied himself with these folks. So to what extent is it the role of the news media to say, look at this man's appalling judgment? <laughs> what went wrong? Yeah, so I, so the the role of media, I mean, I hinted at this a bit in the talk, I mean, is certainly important. I mean, one, you know, the, in a couple of different ways. I mean, it's exacerbated these problems, there's no question. I mean, there's this idea of echo chambers where people only listen to media that they agree with, and there's some, and political scientists have been studying this, and there's some evidence that this does make a difference. You know, the people's views become more polarized if they only listen to media they agree with, or they, you know, they get pushed further to the left and to the right. So this is driven in part by the structure of media, changing structures of our media landscape, both the rise of social media, new forms of social media, but also, you know, this goes back, I mean, there's reforms in the late 1980s that removed the requirement that media uh, give equal treatment to different viewpoints. We kind of forget that this was removed in 1988, I think it was. Uh, so this allowed, and so, you know, Fox News moved right into this and took advantage of this. MSNBC does as well. So, in many ways, this is a that's a national regulatory kind of change that took place that altered.
regard to the deal ends. Um, you know, the question, I guess, you know, and again, I, you know, I think these things matter a great deal. Um, journal, free journalism is important, you know, uh, and you know, the pursuit of truth is absolutely critical. And I think in many ways the media, journalists and media played a, a heroic role in many ways in exposing and not being intimidated by threats of libel and so on from the Trump administration, which, which in other countries, in Hungary and Turkey, journalists have been sued in prison for reporting critical criticisms. You know, and so libel laws could change libel laws, that's something to keep an eye on, could, be, could have an impact of, of, of dampening criticism. So, all that said, I think the media is doing, in many respects, is doing a great job, but I think there is this threat of increased polarization. But again, I think this is exacerbating these deeper demographic trends that we've been talking about. We're going to call the questions. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah.